continue our discussion on membrane transport. What we have been looking at previously is the membrane proteins, integral proteins, peripheral proteins, and how they will are able to conduct the transport of material from one side to the other. We have looked at passive transport. In this lecture, we will be looking at active transport and understand what we mean by a membrane potential in a membrane potential in addition to the thermodynamics of membrane transport. There are several terminologies that we will come across, a uniport, symport, and antiport which we had previously looked at in the earlier lecture. Then we will look at ATPase type proteins and how they can transfer sodium, potassium, and calcium ions across the membrane. When we look at the thermodynamics of membrane transport, we have the chemical potential. The chemical potential is the molar Gibbs energy and the transfer is always from a higher chemical potential to a lower chemical potential. In this case, we are talking about the concentration of the ions as they are transported across the membrane. So if we look at the standard expression for the chemical potential, where we have the standard chemical potential given by mu zero, and we have the different concentrations, the concentration C and the standard state of concentration, in this case, which would be one unit of concentration of C, making this G is equal to G0 plus RTL and C by Z, C0. Considering a one unit of concentration, we can reduce this to this form. Now, if we look at the transfer now from a certain concentration outside the cell to a specific concentration inside the cell, then we have our expression that we got from the previous slide, G is equal to G0 plus RT, L and C. This means that when we are looking at the concentration inside the cell, we will have a corresponding G associated with the inside of the cell. Similarly, we will have one associated with the concentration of the ion outside the cell. If we now want to look at the delta G of this transport, we will have G in, G out, G in minus G out because we are going from outside to inside, which means that the final condition or the final process is the transport of the ion of a concentration C, so C out to C in. So this gives our expression related to the delta G associated with the transfer. And we realize that if this transfer has to be spontaneous, then this value delta G has to be negative. So the direction here is from outside to the inside. If we go further into the thermodynamics of this understanding, we have a delta G that we found out is RT, L, and C in by C out. And the transmembrane movement of ions will therefore depend upon the charge across the membrane because we are transporting these ions across the membrane. So in addition to the chemical potential, we are going to have an electrochemical potential that is defined in a similar manner where we have an electrochemical potential given by the psi in minus psi out where we have a specific transfer of the ions where this delta psi is the membrane potential. Now this is therefore the voltage difference between the inside and the outside of the cell. If we Consider a similar argument for the electrochemical potential like we looked at for the chemical potential. Then we have the work done to bring one mole of an ion from a standard state to a specific concentration and electrical potential. So in this case, we have an electrical potential that will be defined as our mu i prime mu i plus z i f psi, where we have the electrochemical potential of I, the chemical potential of I and the valence, the charge of the ion that is being transported, F, the Faraday constant and psi, the local electrostatic potential. 
If we were to do a similar exercise for the electrochemical potential like we did for the chemical potential, so we are now transferring the ion and the electrical work associated with this transfer is going to be given by our Zf delta phi. So in delta psi. So in addition to this, what we have is we have the chemical potential associated with the transfer and we have the electrochemical potential associated with this. So we have our RT, we have the ionic charge, we have the F and now we realize that if delta G is negative, then the process would be a spontaneous process. So we have a delta psi associated with the electrochemical potential. We have a change in concentration of the inside and the outside of the cell. And we realize that if this delta G happens to be negative, then there is no external energy required for this specific transfer to occur. So when we look at the different processes that occur, we have simple diffusions where we have the passive diffusion of some gases and water across the membrane. We can have specific transport that is mediated via channel protein that and we learned how the channel protein may be triggered to open to for the transfer of material across the membrane we can have a specific carrier protein that is going to be associated with conformational changes due to the transfer and active transport that will require our atp for the process to occur which we will be addressing so when we look at this active transport where we have the ATP associated with the transfer, there are several types that can actually occur where this process is called active transport. So what we have is we have an ATP powered pump. In this case, we have the pumps that utilize the energy that is released by ATP hydrolysis. And what this does is this powers the movement of the ions across the membrane. Now, this transport could be with the chemical gradient, with the electrochemical gradient, or against the electrochemical gradient in most cases where we have to have this process triggered by the ATP hydrolysis. So the pump that we have and when so these, these arrows indicate, so this is the exterior, this is the cytoplasmic part and the arrow, the narrow end indicates a lower electrochemical potential. So when we have a transport of the ion from a lower electrochemical potential to a higher electrochemical potential, we realize that this process is not favored. So what happens is we have the ATP hydrolysis that assists this pump in the transport of the ions shown by the red circle here across the membrane. Similarly, we can have these ion channels. The channels would permit the movement of specific ions or water down their electrochemical gradient. So here we would have a diffusion where we are going from a higher electrochemical gradient to a electrochemical potential to a smaller electrochemical potential, a favorable process that would occur. When we have the transporters, they have three groups of transporters that facilitate the transport of specific small molecules or ions and they can work along or against a concentration gradient and or electrochemical gradient. So when we're looking at the specific concentration gradient and we expect it to go in this direction, if it were a diffusion across the membrane, that would be facilitated. However, it is also possible to have these work in a different fashion where we, we would have ATP triggered movement that will make it transport against the specific potential, whether it is the concentration potential or the, chem the electrochemical potential. So the membrane transport in general would have an ATP powered pump that would allow the process to occur against a concentration gradient or at against an electrochemical gradient. Similarly, there would be an ion channel or the regular transporter of ions. When we look at these processes now, we can have in the transport types, we can have a uniport, 
we can have a symport or we can have an antiport and depending on whether they were or towards the a favorable potential or against a potential we would have them assisted by the atp hydrolysis which we will see in the subsequent slides so when we look at these transport proteins we have the uniport that is a facilitated diffusion that allows the diffusion to occur in a specific direction in symport we have the co-transport so the transport is against a gradient that occurs by displacement of one or more ions and the molecules move in the same direction so here we see the molecules they move in the same direction and this could be against a concentration gradient or a potential gradient where atp hydrolysis would be used to assist this transport the antiport allows the exchange diffusion where the molecules move in opposite direction so as the one that there is a specific set of ions or molecules coming into the cell and a set that is going out of the cell so these are the different types of transport processes that could occur with with a uniport a symport or an antiport so in the active transport that we're looking at we realize that there is atp required to transport the substance inside or outside of the membrane and this transport occurs against a concentration gradient where we are going from a lower concentration to a higher concentration there are different types of atp is associate, associated with the transport processes depending upon the types of ions they transfer for example a p type atp is are reversibly phosphorylated by internal phosphorylation during the transport cycle of say potassium sodium or calcium the f type they have they transport protons in mitochondria the v type atpase pumps protons into the cellular compartment then we have the a type that transports anions and the abc transporter types that are atp binding cassettes as they are called that transport ions and small molecules lipids and drugs across the membranes if we look at the sodium potassium atp is associated with this this is a plasma membrane and alpha beta dimer forming a tetrameric protein it is an anti porter meaning that the transfer it is in one direction and in the one of the ions and in the opposite direction for the other ions and this creates a charge separation across the membrane so there is an electrochemical potential associated with this transfer and this is a very important process because it involves the, the filtering of blood to remove the waste products it absorbs glucose and amino acids regulates ph and this is what the structure looks like so we have the two alpha units and the two beta units we have carbohydrates attached to these units and specific atp binding sites for the processes to occur this is the overall reaction that occurs where we have three sodium ions inside the cell and two potassium ions outside the cell and we have them reverse after the atp hydrolysis occurs in the specific series of steps that occurs so when we look at these active transporters in general we have the binding of the atp the adp or the pi that determines the dominant conformation of the transporter depending upon how or when it is going to transport the ions so the atp binding process the hydrolysis process and the product release involves a switching between the different conformations which is extremely important in the transport process the specific types of proteins known as atp binding cassette transporters are a super family of integral membrane proteins that are involved in the atp power translocation of many substances across the cell membrane and there are specific abc domains that provide nucleotide dependent functional properties where the binding of the atp will result in a conformational change that is going to facilitate 
the transfer of the specific substrate, specific ion across the membrane. So the ABC transporters transport various substrates across the cellular membranes and how do they do it? That is by the hydrolysis of ATP. Once ATP is bound to the conserved ABC domain. For example, if we look at this specific ABC transporter, we see there is a substrate binding site and in addition there is an ATP binding site. So the binding of the ATP to the specific site will open up or will create a conformational change in the protein that will assist in the substrate binding. So this is a specific type of ABC transporter just to give you an example of how the process occurs. So this export that occurs, it, this specific protein is a homodimer of half transporters and there are two different types of domains here. One is the N-terminal transmembrane domain that has six helices and there is a C-terminal nucleotide binding domain that is involved in the ATP binding. They interact very tightly and there are two ATP binding sites that are formed at the dimer interface between one motif of one NBD. Then between one motif of one NBD and then what happens is there is a outward facing conformation that allows the substrate to bind as we saw in the previous slide. So when we look at these transport proteins, we understand that they are very active transporters and if there is no ATP, it has an inward open conformation this is stabilized with high solute affinity. However, when there is bound ATP, there is an outward open conformation that is stabilized with low solute affinity and this outward open conformation will then bind the substrate or the ion that has to be transferred within the cell. So, we have ATP binding, we have solute pumping and this can be similar with several different ions as also as the energy source. So if we look at an example of the ion pumps where we look at sodium and potassium in a very brief schematic, what we will look at here is we have the specific E1 ATP type and this once ATP bound is bound, we see there is a conformational change. We have now a closed structure to our complex. Then when we have the transformation of the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP, then the, this is phosphorylated. Then we have a proton come into the picture where we have the loss of ADP. And now what we have is we have after the loss of a sodium ion, we have two of these attached with the proton. But now we see a conformational change to the E2P type. Now, what happens is from the outside, we have two potassium come into the picture where two sodium ions are left out and we have this bound form. As hydrolysis now occurs, then we have the loss of the PI. We have an ATP assisted set where we have now a conformational change in step 7 resulting in the bound form of the two potassium ions now leave the cell. So in a sense what has happened is we have the transport of the sodium and the potassium ions like in the expression that we saw previously. Now in this process what happens is the ion pump we see works as an active transporter with the assistance of ATP that allows this transfer or the transport to occur. So we have the transport of the sodium and the potassium ions. Similarly, when we have a Ca2, a calcium ATPase, this also works in a similar fashion. And this is important for muscle contractions, triggers neurotransmitter release, it regulates glycogen breakdown and the concentrations of calcium in the cytosolic and extracellular regions are different and there is a concentration gradient that is regulated by again the active transport across the plasma membrane. 
This again is an antiport of protons with the calcium ion. So we have a similar setup here where we have ATP binding. This ATP binding, as we can see, creates a variation in the phosphorylation of the structure. And when the ATP is bound, the main idea that we have to get from this is that the ATP bound conformation is allows a conformational change in the protein that allows the substrate to bind. There is calcium transport, then there is phosphate hydrolysis, followed by the recovery. So in a sense, what is happening is we have the transport now of the calcium from the inside to the outside of the cell. So what happens is the transport occurs again on ATP binding. So what we have is we have an, if we look at an overall system where we can picture an iron gradient driven active transport, we have an example where we have the sodium glucose symport, where we have the transport of the ion, the transport of the molecule across. Now, a glucose uniport means that it allows the transport of glucose across this. A facilitated diffusion may then occur with the use of Na plus K plus ATPase that provides the potassium required inside the cell. And this pump we realize is triggered by the ATP hydrolysis to ADP and PI. So the conformational changes that occur in the protein due to the binding of ATP is important in bringing about the active transport of the ions against a specific concentration gradient. So, we have the absorption of glucose by a symport method with Na+. So, if we look at our overall picture again, we have simple diffusion of the ions, we have aquaporin, we have the transport mediated by a carrier protein, we have an active transport where in this case, what we see is we see, we saw where we have three sodium from inside the cell come outside and two potassium go inside of the cell. And how's the, how does this occur? With the ATP hydrolysis that brings about the active transport. So when we look at our specific idea of how we can address these problems, we realize that we have a concentration gradient that is given by a chemical potential. We have a potential gradient given by an electrochemical potential. And this is our expression. And we realize that for the diffusion to occur, we have to have a favorable delta G. This occurs in the following fashion. So if you look at a specific problem that says at 25 degrees centigrade, there is an internal concentration of potassium given by 10 millimolar and the external concentration is 350 millimolar in a giant a squid giant axon. Now, the membrane potential has to be calculated at equilibrium. Now, so this is a typical schematic of what this problem actually is. So, at equilibrium, we realize that membrane potential would be equal to the potassium equilibrium potential. So, we have the delta G, overall delta G, that would be zero. So, we can equate these two specific processes where we have our concentration of the external ion of potassium, the concentration of the internal ions, where we have the value of R, we have Z equal to 1 because we have potassium, we have the Faraday constant and the K plus external and the K plus internal are both values that have been provided in the problem. So if we were to solve this problem, we have T at 298 Kelvin and we find out what the EEQ is by plugging in the specific values and we get a value of minus 91.3 millivolt. So that is the answer to that problem. So when we look at the chemical potential delta G, if we have now another situation where we have the sodium ion concentration inside the cell is 50 millimolar and outside it is 560 millimolar, 
The question is that we have to determine this minimum membrane potential that would be needed to drive sodium transfer out of the cell. So we have a body temperature of 37 degrees centigrade, which we have to use for our expression in this case. So this is what our problem schematic is. We have inside the cell, we have 50 millimolar sodium ions and outside we have 560 millimolar sodium ions. So again, we have a delta G is zero. We consider this to be zero because we have an equilibrium situation. We have our chemical potential and we have our electrochemical potential. Together, we, found, we find out from this what the delta E value is going to be. And if we look now at an antiport system, which uses a pH gradient across the membrane to transport the sodium against its chemical gradient. In this case, we are looking at a sodium out of 100 millimolar and a sodium in of 300 millimolar. We have to calculate the pH gradient that would be necessary to overcome the unfavorable transport of sodium ions and provide in, in addition, provide one kilojoules of mole of energy per mole of energy. So we have this situation here where we have the concentration outside as 100 and inside as 300. So in this case, we are looking at an Na plus to Na in concentration ratio where we get the delta G associated with this. Now, this means that in addition, so we have to give this amount of energy for the transport to occur. And if we want an additional energy, then we have to give a supply of close to 4,000 joules per mole for the specific transport to occur. So this is our value and we want to know what pH has to be done. So we have a proton transfer associated with this process. If we remember the problem that we were looking at, we have an antiport here and we want to find out how these two can be connected. And in this case, we have therefore a concentration ratio of H plus to H plus in to H plus out as 0.226, which would give us a concentration ratio of H plus in to H plus out. And based on this, we can actually determine what the pH is from the expression here. So we have a pH in equal to a pH out plus 0.646 that is the logarithm of 0 0.226 which is minus 0.646. So what we have learned in this lecture is the thermodynamics of membrane transport. At the end we just looked at some specific problems associated with this transfer where we can determine based on an equilibrium situation the electrochemical potential and the chemical potential, the concentration of the ions that are going inside and outside the cell. This is an important aspect of trying to understand how membrane transport occurs. We looked at active transport where we realized that we need the energy from the ATP hydrolysis to bring about the transport of ions across the membrane and this can be brought about by specific sites on the proteins that these membrane proteins that would be able to bind the ATP and on binding there would be conformational changes associated that would create an inward to outward conformation that would allow the substrate to bind followed by the transport across the membrane. These are the references. Thank you.